Is the camera logged in? <clears throat> Good to go. Get going. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon to Q Ross's Paradoxes class, where we learn new things about the origin of the universe and the origin of life and whatever else she was talking about at the time. For those of us who are here, I'd like to remind you to please. Set your phones on quiet so they don't wake anybody up. Remind everyone that as new guests come in, please shepherd them over to the coffee and the water and the sandwiches, which, by the way, Hugh graciously brought. Thank you very much, Hugh, for doing that. Next week, Hugh will not be here, but since I will be, I'll be teaching. And I'll be talking about a subject that's related to evolution and whether we should be having arguments against evolution and whether that's a successful or practical device for propagating the gospel. So with that, I'll hand it off to you, Hugh, and you can open us in prayer. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Microphone on. There we go. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity we have to look at your books of revelation, the book of nature and the book of scripture. And Lord, I pray that we would be humbled before you and uh, be open to receive your grace, uh, your love, your truth, and your life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. While starting a new uh, series uh, this week, this will probably run maybe two or three weeks, and it's a series, well, let me just jump right into it. Uh, this slide just simply indicates if you don't get to ask your question today, and during the Q&A time, we'll be alternating from people that are here in person and uh, those who are participating with us virtually. And uh, so those of you that are virtual, feel free to think about some questions. And during the Q&A time, I'll take any question that pertains to the book of scripture, the book of nature, philosophy, theology, uh, science, uh, whatever. And if you're not already a subscriber, you can subscribe to the Reasons to Believe YouTube channel. Uh, it's free and uh, you'll be notified of videos that are being posted there, and there's literally thousands of videos that uh, you can watch there. And uh, several of my books, you can get free chapters simply by going to reasons.org slash Ross. And uh, this one, The Creator and the Cosmos, covers some of the content I'll be speaking about, uh, but most of it uh, will be in my new book, Designed to the Core, which will be released uh, next month. Uh, but the series we're gonna be launching into, and incidentally, if you missed the uh, last series that we did, uh, it's uh, all available at paradoxes.org, and in the process of editing it to take out uh, all the uh, review and repetition that's in there, I will let you know when that's uh, posted uh, and available. But we're looking at the creation of the elements for life, the elements for civilization, and the elements uh, for the redemption of billions of human beings. And by elements, I mean the elements in the periodic table. And only in the last few weeks have astronomers and physicists been able to determine where indeed all the elements that we see in the periodic table came from. Uh, I remember when I was uh, attending uh, as an undergraduate student, we really only understood where about half the elements in the periodic table came from. I'm gonna be telling the story of how, beginning in the 1950s, astronomers and physicists basically put together the story, and the story was literally only completed uh, just three weeks ago. Uh, but one of the things we recognize is that if you want the elements so that physical life is possible, you do need a certain kind of universe. And a question I wanna ask you, uh, I get asked this question all the time. I'm curious how many of you ever get this question. When you talk to people, they say, why, if there's a God, uh, does there have to be so many useless galaxies? And this needs to be updated, by the way. Uh, it's two trillion galaxies that we now know exist in the universe. Uh, but if God wants life on one planet in the universe, 
then why all these other useless galaxies? Why has there to be 10 trillion trillion uh, stars? So I just want to know, how many of you ever heard that question? If there's a God, why do you have to have such a big uh, universe? Well, the answer is, thank you, by the way, for uh, letting me get that survey. For those of you watching online, about half the people in the audience put up their hands. Uh, but the answer is that the universe's mass determines what elements you get. If the universe is less massive, you wind up with a certain set of elements in the periodic table. If it's more massive, you wind up uh, with a different set. And the greater the cosmic mass density, the more hydrogen is fused into helium during the first few minutes after the cosmic creation event. And in the Big Bang creation, you have the universe beginning infinitesimally small and nearly infinitely hot. And then after the universe is created, it expands. And as it expands under the laws of thermodynamics, it gets cooler and cooler as it continues to expand. Uh, all of you here have seen that principle work out if you drove a car to come here uh, because the principle of the piston engine is that when the combustion chamber expands, the gasoline stops burning. When the piston chamber compresses, that raises the temperature. That's a principle that applies to everything in the universe. If a system expands, uh, it will get cooler and cooler as it expands. So the universe starts off nearly infinitely hot, and as it expands, it cools down. And it reaches a point where it goes through the temperature where nuclear fusion can occur. Because the universe starts off with just one element, the element hydrogen. And hydrogen gets fused into helium between about 150 and 17 billion degrees uh, centigrade. And the mass of the universe determines how much time the universe spends in that temperature window from 150 to 17 uh, billion degrees. And if the universe is less massive than what it is, it will speed through that temperature window in less than 20 seconds. In fact, it will speed through that temperature window uh, so quickly that so little hydrogen will be fused into helium. That's step one of the fusion process, hydrogen getting fused into helium. So little hydrogen is fused into helium that the future stars are unable to take that mixture of hydrogen and helium and fuse any other heavier elements, which means that the universe forever has nothing but hydrogen and helium. And so this is what the periodic table would look like. It sure would make passing chemistry a lot easier, right? You got hydrogen and helium, nothing else. Uh, you do get chemistry, by the way, because two hydrogen atoms will come together and make hydrogen too. And incidentally, that's the most abundant molecule in the universe. Uh, the second most abundant molecule is hydrogen-3. But you actually will get uh, hydrogen and helium bonded together. It's extremely uh, challenging, uh, so there's very little of it in the universe. But hey, uh, that would be your chemistry class. Hydrogen-2, hydrogen-3, and then a very tiny, uh, trivial amount of uh, a hydrogen-helium uh, bond. Now, if you make the universe slightly more massive than what it is, then the universe will spend so much time in that temperature window from 150 billion to 17 billion degrees uh, centigrade that it will fuse more than 24%. The universe we live in right now, during the Big Bang, first few minutes after the creation event, approximately 24% of the primordial hydrogen is fused into helium. But make the universe the tiniest bit more massive, you get more than 24% helium. And that means when the future stars form, they take that hydrogen and helium and very quickly, at least on an astronomical time scale, uh, quickly convert all that hydrogen and helium into elements that are heavier than manganese. So with the universe slightly more massive than the one we live in, 
This is what the periodic table looks like. You got iron, and you get all the elements heavier than iron, but you got nothing lighter than iron. Now notice that with a universe slightly less massive or more massive than ours, you have a universe with no carbon, no oxygen, no nitrogen, uh, no sodium, no phosphorus, no potassium. These are the elements that are essential for light. They're missing in both cases. Now you might ask, okay, to what degree do we have to fine tune the mass of the universe uh, to get this periodic table? the periodic table that for all your public school classrooms? The answer is, if it wasn't for the existence of dark energy, you would have to fine tune the mass of the universe to better than one part in a quadrillion, 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 quadrillion. Better than one part in 10 to the 60th. Now, that's many orders of magnitude greater than the very best example of any kind of design uh, that weak human beings have ever achieved. Now, with dark energy, you don't need the mass of the universe to be that fine-tuned. It still has to be fine-tuned, but you can drop a few of those uh, zeros. But the problem is, you now have to fine-tune the dark energy to one part in 10 to the 122nd mm -hmm. power. <coughs> so 60 zeros compared to 122 zeros and yes, you still have to have an extraordinarily fine-tuned mass to get this periodic table. You also have to have the mass extremely fine-tuned to get galaxies, stars, and planets. Because if the universe is less massive, the universe expands so rapidly that galaxies, stars, and planets will not form. The universe remains nothing but dispersed gas. And if you make the universe slightly more massive, then yes, stars will form, but they'll quickly uh, wind up as neutron stars and black holes. And so there again, uh, light becomes impossible. However, uh, when physicists began to look at this in the early 1950s, they recognized that there was a roadblock to go from hydrogen and helium, even with the just right mass, and get elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So. A just right cosmic mass density itself is not enough. Fine tuning the cosmic mass alone is not enough in order to get the elements that are essential for life and to get them in the appropriate abundances. But what happened in 1955 and 56 is that Fred Hoyle, Willie Fowler, and Margaret and Jeffrey Burbage got together at Caltech and began to work out what, how on earth we wound up with the carbon, the nitrogen, and oxygen that we have. And what they recognized then was that crucial to getting anything beyond helium was that the ground state energy level of the helium atom plus the ground state energy level of a second helium atom needed to add up to the ground state energy level of beryllium, which means you could actually take helium helium in the furnace of a star, and because the ground state energy levels of two heliums adds up uh, very close to the ground state energy level of beryllium, you can actually get beryllium. Put two helium together and you wind up uh, with uh, beryllium. And then the ground state energy level of beryllium plus the ground state energy of helium very nearly is equal to the excited state energy level of carbon. And if it wasn't for these equivalences, you would never get anything heavier than carbon. So this is the pathway which, whereby you can get carbon. Uh, but as Willie Fowler and Fred Hoyle and Margaret and Jeffrey Burbage looked at this, they said, well, we can figure out why there's carbon in the universe it's because of these extraordinarily fine-tuned uh, energy levels uh, for beryllium, helium, and carbon. But how do we get the nitrogen? How do we get the oxygen? And what they discovered is that it's quite easy to get a universe that's got lots of carbon and little or no oxygen, or lots of oxygen and little or no 
uh, carbon. I mean, if you add helium to the carbon, you get oxygen. And what they discovered is the only way you can get a balance, because for life to exist in the universe, physical life to exist in the universe, you need uh, lots of carbon and lots of oxygen. And what they discovered is <coughs> the ground state energy level of carbon is very nearly equal to the ground state energy level of oxygen. 7.65 million electron volts for carbon and 7.12 million electron volts for oxygen. And if it wasn't for the near equivalence of the uh, uh, ground state energy levels for carbon and oxygen, you'd wind up with an imbalance. Either a whole lot of carbon and no oxygen, or a whole lot of oxygen and no carbon. For life, you need them. And for life, it's crucial that there be slightly more oxygen than there is carbon. And the reason why you get slightly more oxygen, notice that the ground state energy level of oxygen is slightly less than it is for carbon. So that explains how we get a universe uh, with more oxygen than carbon. So hydrogen's the most abundant element in the universe. Uh, helium is next. Number three is oxygen. And number four is carbon. And, and this is what Fred Hoyle wrote years later. By the way, uh, the paper that was published by Fred Hoyle and uh, Willie Fowler and Margaret and Jeffrey Burbage was published in 1956. To this day, it ranks as the most cited physics paper of all time. They were the ones that figured out how it's possible that stars could actually fuse all the elements that we see in the periodic table. But years later, Fred Hoyle uh, spoke at a conference of uh, technical engineers and wound up uh, getting his uh, lecture uh, published in their journal. And here's a quote uh, from his lecture. He says, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as with the chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me to be so overwhelming as to put this conclusion <coughs> beyond question. And he's made this uh, statement in several of his books and basically has said, for me, uh, for Fred Hoyle, this is the most profound fine tuning that we see within the universe. The fact that all these ground state energy levels are precisely what they need to be in order to get uh, the periodic table that we see here. Now, one question that people often raise is, does life actually critically depend on a little more oxygen than there is carbon? Do we need the nitrogen? Do we need the potassium? Do we need the phosphorus? People used to speculate maybe it's possible that uh, we could have life that's not like us. Have you ever heard that argument? What about life not as we know it? Okay, yeah. I get that all the time. Looks like a lot of you do as well. Well, it turns out if there's life elsewhere in the universe, physical life uh, that's constrained by the laws of physics, I'm not talking about angels, but life that's uh, constrained by the laws of physics, it must be carbon-based. Now, decades ago, uh, biochemists speculated maybe we can make life based on silicon. And you've probably been exposed to a number of science fiction books that talk about silicon-based life. Uh, it actually turns out that you're probably better off with boron-based life or arsenic-based life. Uh, but today we know the only game in town is carbon. Carbon is the only element in the periodic table that has the necessary bonding complexity and bonding stability to get the elements, the molecules you need for life, to get the equivalent of DNA, RNA, and the proteins and the lipids uh, that life requires. So uh, if you've got questions on that, I'll take it later. But I'm going to be making an assumption throughout here for talking about physical life it's carbon-based uh, physical life. Now, this explains how you can get
carbon and oxygen in the early stars, what about the rest of the elements? Well, when I was a graduate student, they were saying the rest of the elements come from three different populations of stars. And so the first stars to form, <coughs> excuse me, are stars that form out of the hydrogen and helium that's produced by the Big Bang. The Big Bang, by the way, also produces a tiny amount of a lithium, just a trace amount, but that's just three elements. And so the first generation of stars will take that uh, hydrogen and helium, and the larger stars will burn up fairly quickly, and when they end their burning cycle, they explode and throw it into interstellar space the ashes of their nuclear burning. Now these firstborn stars uh, aren't going to have a lot of the heavier elements, but they'll have lots of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and that gets blasted out in interstellar space. Then the second generation of stars now have not just hydrogen and helium, they also have small amounts of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen from the ashes that fill interstellar space. And astronomers refer to those stars as population two stars. The first category is population three, the first born stars in the universe. And incidentally, that's one of the objectives of the James Webb Space Telescope, is to be able to spectroscopically study the very first born stars in the universe to check whether or not Big Bang cosmology got it right, that these first stars will be composed of nothing but hydrogen and helium and a trace amount of a lithium. Uh, we'll probably have that result back uh, within a year. Um, but the population's two stars, because they have enriched carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, their nuclear furnaces are much more efficient in producing elements heavier uh, than oxygen. So they produce lots of iron, uh, and they produce uh, many of these elements we see here in the periodic table. And the bigger of those population two stars again will burn up quickly. The more massive the star, the faster it burns up. And uh, when it ends its uh, burning cycle, it'll explode the ashes of its nuclear furnace into interstellar space. And uh, then you get a third generation of stars forming. But this third generation forms from the ashes of a population two stars. And that enrichment causes the population three stars to be even more efficient and uh, converting those elements into heavier elements. And uh, the bigger the population three stars, or population one stars, pardon me, uh, when they end their burning, they will blast into interstellar space, a significantly richer mixture of these elements, uh, heavier than helium. We are orbiting a population one star. So our star has been blessed uh, with the enrichment of elements uh, from burnt out population three and population two stars. And because our star is relatively low in its mass, uh, it also benefits from the ashes of the first form population one stars. And so this explains the elements, or so astronomers had thought. It turns out that if you look at the elements heavier than iron, uh, only half of those elements form through what are called slow neutron capture events, which is something that we can easily understand uh, from exploded uh, population uh, two and three stars. But the other half are what we call rapid neutron capture elements. And for decades, it was a mystery. How do you get these rapid uh, neutron because what was recognized, the only way about half the elements you see in this uh, upper part of the uh, periodic table is they need to have, <coughs> they have to form in an environment where you've got a very dense stream of relativistic neutrons. That's neutrons moving at near relativistic velocities. And so the point was ordinary stars are not going to provide us with that. So maybe really big supernova uh, can provide the density and the speed of neutrons necessary to make some of those elements. And years ago, 
the assumption was, well, we think that's where all these R process elements come from. All that changed when astronomers began to study uh, neutron star merging events and black hole merging events. And so here's a couple of slides here uh, where you got a couple of black holes orbiting one another or neutron stars. And uh, with black holes, so say we got two gigantic stars that are in uh, an orbit around one another, they burn up uh, their nuclear fuel and they wind up uh, ending up as two neutron stars, a neutron star and a black hole, or two black holes. But either way, these stars are gonna lose gravitational energy as they orbit about one another, according to Einstein's theory of general relativity. And as they lose gravitational energy, their orbits begin to collapse and they get closer and closer to one another. So you see this spiral effect. And as they get really close to one another, <coughs> you begin to see the beginnings of a merger event. And this is what uh, computers have been able to simulate what happened just before the two neutron stars or the two black holes uh, merged together. And uh, the prediction is that they would merge together and there'd be such a loss of gravitational energy that the mass of the resultant object would be less than the mass of the two objects that started it. Now, that's background. And uh, astronomers and physicists realize, hey, if we really want to figure out what's going on in any kind of detail, we need to actually be able to detect gravity waves. And uh, gravity is the weakest of the four forces of physics. And only recently have uh, we humans been able to develop the technology to detect gravity waves. And uh, the first such gravity wave telescope was constructed in uh, Hanford, uh, Washington. If you're not familiar with Hanford, that was where uh, they began to make uh, the nuclear material for the first atomic bomb. Uh, they picked a desert in the southwest portion of the state of Washington, because nobody lives there. Uh, and this has been used, it's a government site. So they said, okay, this is where we're gonna put our gravity wave telescope. So this is a, a photo of uh, the gravity wave telescope in Hanford, uh, Washington. And it's basically an interferometer, a laser interferometer. And you can see the two arms, and uh, they meet together in the headquarters there. Each arm is four kilometers long. And if you go inside the tunnel, uh, this is what it looks like. You've got this a tube here and where the laser beam comes out. And the way it's designed is you've got a very accurate mirror at each end of the four miles. And uh, in order to get some idea of the directionality, uh, they have at a two angles there. So that means as gravitational waves come in, you get a slightly different signal uh, depending on the arm uh, structure there. <laughs> but it's an amazing instrument, excuse me, in that this is designed in such a way that they can measure the path. They send a laser beam from one mirror to the other and back, and they can measure the distance between the two mirrors by timing the, time, the amount of time it takes for light to go from one mirror to another. They can measure the distance uh, between the two mirrors separated by four kilometers uh, to a tenth the diameter of a proton. That's how sensitive this instrument is. And so what they're counting on is the gravitational waves coming in and disturbing the mirrors and what they're trying to do is measure the degree to which those mirrors are being disturbed. That will tell them uh, what the gravity wave signal is coming in from an extraterrestrial source. The problem is there's plenty of activity on planet Earth that will cause the mirrors to do this. You know, if a truck goes by on a highway, it's gonna cause things. If there's a, a small uh, earthquake, it's gonna cause the mirrors to separate. Matter of fact, this is so sensitive that even though this is in the far eastern part of the state of Washington, 
uh, the waves, the gentle one foot high waves that are crashing on the shore of western uh, Washington is enough to separate those mirrors by a far greater degree than any incoming gravitational waves. Which is why they built an identical laser interferometer in the state of Louisiana, in Livingston, Louisiana. Because the, think the thinking was any wave crashing on the shore of the state of Washington is going to jiggle the mirrors uh, differently than it will jiggle them in the state of Louisiana. And likewise, the waves that are crashing on the shore from the Gulf of Mexico are going to have a different disturbance than they would in Washington. Incidentally, before they actually detected the mergers of the black holes, they set up a third uh, facility in Pisa, Italy. So three different locations. And incidentally, they're building several of these around the world now. Uh, the one in India is about to come online, uh, for example. <clears throat> so what they do is they only uh, detect as gravity waves from an extraterrestrial source where they get the identical signal at all three sites. Because anything that's ground-based uh, is going to give a different signal at one site than another site. So they have to use a massive computer uh, uh, you know, processing in order to eliminate all the ground-based signals and ferret out what comes uh, from uh, outer space. But this is what it looks like in terms of the gravity waves you see coming in. And take a look at the bottom line there. This all happens in 0.2 seconds. And so as these two black holes are orbiting one another and getting closer and closer to one another and they merge, this all happens in two tenths of a second, which you can see is that the wavelengths get shorter and shorter, which means the distance between the two black holes is getting closer and closer. And then if you go right here at the zero point, uh, this is when they actually merge. That's when the signal gets to be the strongest. That's the merge point. Then it quickly dampens down and you see nothing. So that's gravity wave telescope astronomy. Uh, here's another example uh, where you can see the wavelengths getting shorter and shorter, stronger and stronger, and then suddenly it just disappears. Now, some of the physics that came out of this that actually uh, helps test uh, cosmic and particle creation models, they were able to measure the timing in which the gravity waves reach the gravity wave telescope and also uh, look at the light that was coming in, and they were able to determine that the difference between the incoming velocity of gravity waves and the incoming velocity of light waves was identical uh, to better than 14 decimal places. That the difference between the incoming velocity of gravity waves and the velocity of light was less than 3 times 10 to the minus 15, which is a huge prediction of the biblical uh, creation model, namely that the velocity of light is going to be the same as the velocity of gravity waves. And so this has been the most definitive uh, demonstration of that. They're also determined that the mass of the graviton, if you've got gravity waves, you're going to have gravity particles. But that the mass of the graviton is less than 3.14 times 10 to the minus 59 kilograms. And if you want to compare that with the mass of the proton, uh, it's less than 10 to the 30 times uh, the mass of a proton, which was gratifying to the particle physicists because that was a key prediction of the particle creation model, namely that the mass of the graviton uh, would be extremely tiny. It would have the least mass of any of the fundamental particles. And it's crucial for there to be life that have that uh, small of a mass. Now, often I get asked the question, are physicists going to be able to use the Large Hadron Collider to detect a graviton? The answer is no. With a mass that tiny, it's not going to be able to detect a, a graviton. Uh, matter of fact, even if you're able to build a particle accelerator uh, that was the dimensions of the entire universe, it still wouldn't be sensitive enough to detect the graviton. Bottom line is, we're never going to detect a graviton. Uh, but it is comforting to realize we've got a limit on it uh, thanks to these uh, mergers of black holes that tells us that it indeed 
is way too tiny for humans ever to be able to measure it, but it's gratifying in that that allows our cosmic creation model to be consistent with our particle uh, creation model. Um, okay, I'm going to stop right there because I'm at the 30 minute point. So uh, we'll pick this up uh, uh, two weeks from now. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'll be talking about how uh, this also affirms uh, the biblical principle that the laws of physics are uh, constant and unchanging. And uh, this has been verified. We'll get into some other things. But where I'm going to be taking you two weeks from now is how the study of the merger of black holes and the merger of uh, particularly neutron stars. Neutron star merging events we now recognize are responsible for over 90% of the R process elements. And we humans wouldn't be here unless our solar system had the extraordinary good fortune of forming adjacent to at least one, if not several, neutron star merging events where the neutron star merging events were not so close to destroy the emerging solar system, but not so distant as to give us the crucial R process elements that we need for life and that we need uh, for civilization. And incidentally, two of those elements are crucial for human beings to be alive. Two of them are in your bodies and must be there. So I'll stop there and uh, I'll take questions. And again, we'll take questions on any topic. And let's begin with you. We're going to wait, get, get our microphone for this gentleman if we could. Yeah, we want to have all the questions uh, recorded. Yes, I want to ask uh, if the scientists like you know all these ramifications of science, the internal design, everything like that, why did they ever believe in God? I mean, most of them. Well, I think probably a larger percentage do believe in God, uh, but probably they're deists and not theists and not Christians. You know, as I engage uh, physicists and astronomers who identify themselves as atheists or agnostics, when I ask them, well, do you believe that there has to be some kind of causal agent beyond the universe? a broader universe of matter, energy, space, and time to existence, they say, well, yes, but I don't believe in God. But, you know, that is a good dictionary definition of God, but what the really meaning is, I'm okay with a causal agent creating universe as long as it doesn't interfere beyond that. But you're making a good point. All this fine tuning we're seeing is not just at the cosmic level, it's actually at all levels. And so what I'm going to be doing uh, when I come back in two weeks is basically show you all the fine tuning that's necessary just to get the elements that are crucial, not only for humans to exist, but for us to have civilization, and particularly the level of civilization that's necessary to take the good news of salvation to all the people uh, groups of the world. But a second answer to your question is what you see in Romans 1, 18 through 22 where it makes the point God has clearly revealed himself and his attributes to all the peoples of the world, but that those who do not want God to be an authority over their lives engage in self-imposed ignorance. They choose to ignore that which they know to be true. And so the rebellion in the human heart. And you know, I talk to people about that, say, well, I'm not in rebellion, I believe all the science but are you really acting on everything that the science reveals or only that part uh, which you feel uh, comfortable with? So that's the challenge. Uh, here we have an online question. Yes. From Scott. Is salvation an instant event or a process that requires perseverance to achieve? Good question. Is salvation an instantaneous event, event or is it a process? Well, I think the biblical answer to that is that salvation uh, has uh, three uh, components. There's justification, where we become justified uh, from the offenses we've committed against God and others. And that is an instantaneous event. The moment that we transfer the control of our lives 
from ourselves to Jesus Christ, make him the master of his life, and agree with God that uh, we want to receive uh, Christ's offer of redemption from all of our offenses against him and others, past, present, and future. At that instant, we become a child of God. Uh, we become justified, uh, delivered from the consequences of all the sins that we've ever uh, committed or will commit. But the process part is what the Bible refers to as sanctification, how having received Christ as creator, Lord, and Savior, and have allowed the Holy Spirit to come into your life, that Holy Spirit begins to uh, endow you with a desire and a power to live the Christian life. And that's a process that goes through uh, your whole life here on planet Earth. And so as we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to work within us, the Holy Spirit step by step delivers us from our practice of sin and step by step delivers us uh, from the power of sin over our lives and gives us a desire and the power to live the Christian life. The third component of salvation is glorification. Uh, when we leave this life as a child of God, we go through the refining fire and we become perfected. So no human here on planet Earth, no matter how sanctified they are, can claim that they have been completely delivered from sin. It's a process. Only when we pass from this life to the next life and go through the purification uh, that is described in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, uh, 10 uh, through 15, uh, do we become completely uh, glorified. And question over here. Hugh, regarding the 22 elements that are necessary for biological systems, how long have those 22 elements been in existence? It seems to me that would be a really good number for people to have in their mind when people say, well, the universe is 14 billion years old, life could have happened at any time. There's, it's, it's actually a much shorter window. How long have those 22 elements been, been around? Well, Ross, you're asking a really good question. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that when I come back in two weeks is actually look at those elements. And what's interesting about those elements is that many of them are what we call vital poisons. Too much, you'll die. Too little, you'll die. They have to be at the just right levels. And the question you're asking is, how much time does it take in the history of the universe for there to be a planet with those 22 elements at the just right levels? A number of astronomers have written papers on this making the point it takes the full age of the universe to get these stars to produce the elements in such a way that you even have a possibility with a planet with all these elements at the just right level. And they add a second component. If you want that uh, life to have global civilization, there's a whole bunch more elements that have to be available at just right levels. And they use that as a basis for saying, maybe intelligent life after us, elsewhere in the universe, but not before. Because we humans are living in the history of the universe at the minimum time necessary to get all the elements that we need uh, for our bodies to be able to exist and thrive, and for us to have the elements we need uh, to have a global high-tech uh, civilization. Uh, but because there's fine-tuning of too much versus too little, uh, also there's a narrow window. You can't go too far into the future, because you go too far in the future, you wind up again outside of the windows of the different abundance levels. Mm -hmm. However, astronomers are writing these papers saying, we think that there could be as much as a billion years after us uh, where intelligent physical life is possible, uh, but no possibility before us. And so their papers are basically saying, maybe intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, but after us, not before. We are the first on the cosmic scene. Uh, here we have a question coming in from Craig McMahon. Mm -hmm. Do your initial comments on the fine tuning required to produce the periodic table we have suggest whether or not it is possible to produce elements greater than 118? 
Well, uh, we can explain 94 of the elements in the periodic table uh, without any human intervention. I mean, right now we got 92, uh, but early in the history of the universe, we also had plutonium and neptunium. But they decay away in a few tens of millions of years. Uh, so uh, if you go back about uh, uh, three billion years ago, all the plutonium and neptunium is gone. So uh, uranium is kind of at the top. And uh, what physicists have been able to do uh, is using uh, nuclear reactors to actually make elements uh, that are uh, heavier uh, than plutonium and neptunium. Now, uh, there have been papers published where they say we think we can get californium by natural process. In fact, there's an effort going on to actually look at uh, uh, big bright stars and see if they can detect the production of californium. And there actually may have been, I, I, I'm not really clear, they may have already discovered it, but californium, uh, we're talking at lasting just minutes. And so the only way you're gonna see it naturalistically is where it's being first produced in one of these supergiant stars. Uh, but literally within a few days, it's all gonna be gone. So, and I don't know about the other elements being naturalistically <coughs> produced. Uh, beyond 118, the half-lives are so incredibly short. Although there are papers published saying, we think there's a possibility for some of the elements heavier than 118, uh, you know, uh, a number of protons in it, could actually have a half-life longer than a few minutes. So that, that's not yet settled. Hello, Dr. Ross. I saw a link online the other day, and I got sidetracked. I wasn't able to punch on the link, but it, it talked about how the planets and the universe were aligning up. Um, <clears throat> could you expound on that, um, why that was happening and what was going on? And there was also something about a, red, a blood red moon that, that occurred within, within recent Yes. Uh, months, I believe. Um, can you expound on that, on how it, it um, corresponds with uh, Hebrew festivals, et cetera? Yes. Well, there was a blood, blood red moon uh, just a few weeks ago. I got to see it. Uh, and uh, what a blood red moon is, is uh, a total lunar eclipse. And the reason why the moon looks red uh, during a total lunar eclipse is that the only light being reflected off the surface of the moon is Earth shine. It's light that passes through Earth's atmosphere. And so like if there's a lot of forest fires or a lot of pollution in Earth's atmosphere, you'll get a redder color than normal. You know, light when it passes through dust gets reddened. And so uh, any total lunar eclipse the eclipse is gonna look orange or red because of the fact that it's being illuminated by light passing through Earth's atmosphere. Uh, but if the Earth's atmosphere at that time tends to have a lot of dust in it, uh, you'll get a redder color. So, uh, and you get two of those per year. So uh, total lunar eclipses are uh, common. You get two a year. And because it's a lunar eclipse, typically half of people in the world can see it. It's not like a solar eclipse where only a very limited part of the surface of the Earth do you see totality. With a lunar eclipse, uh, uh, probably half the world can, can see it. And yeah, there's been some discussion that maybe these uh, lunar eclipses uh, fall in line with some of the Hebrew festival days. Um, and that's to be expected because, for example, uh, Passover uh, is a day when you get a new moon. Uh, so uh, you, you, you get a correspondence <coughs> there. So any, any Hebrew holiday or any holiday in any other religion that's tied to the cycle of the moon, uh, don't be surprised uh, if you get some consistency uh, with the blood moons. John Hagee wrote a book, um, The Four Blood Moons. Yes, I'm familiar with his book. 
I read it years ago. I have to skim through it again to kind of ref bring a refresher of what he was talking about. Um, okay, so the planets, how they were aligned the other night? Do you know anything yeah, about that? As far that? as what John Hagee's book, The Four Blood Moons, is all about, uh, John actually called me and said, we're doing a t film documentary on my book, The Four Blood Moons. He says, you're an astronomer. I also know you're a skeptic uh, to my model. And so would you appear on the, uh, on, in the movie? So I'm in the movie. And I'm also uh, part of a panel that he put together uh, where they had a number of people, theologians, philosophers, uh, commenting on it. Uh, I was a lone astronomer there. I was also the lone skeptic. Uh, and so basically making a point that uh, John Hagee was saying uh, these blood moons are a sign of uh, eschatology, how the end times in Daniel and Revelation are about to be uh, predicted uh, because it talks about uh, the blood, uh, the light of the moon uh, turning blood, blood red. And my response was, well, uh, the book of Joel and the book of Revelation doesn't just talk about the moon, uh, it talks about the sun, moon, and stars all turning red. And uh, therefore, this is not your sign of biblical prophecy because only the moon is turning red, not the stars and the sun. And basically what you see in Revelation chapter 6 and 8 is that uh, that same prophecy about the sun, moon, and stars turning red like the blood of a corpse is in the same context of uh, a third of the forests and grasses of planet Earth being burnt. And if you burn up a third of the grasses and forests of the Earth, you're going to have so much dust in Earth's atmosphere that the sun, moon, and stars will all be turned a, a deep red color. And so my whole point was uh, this is not a fulfillment of prophecy because only the moon is turning red. It happens all the time. And he was also assuming that blood red moons are rare. He said, no, you get two per year. And moreover, this was supposed to be a sign in Israel. And the one he was referring to, this was back in 2017 or 18, just uh, that they were uh, doing this. And I said, the problem with the blood moon you're citing is it looks blood red in the United States, but not in Israel. And so if this is a sign for Israel, why is it not showing up there and showing up here? It was interesting, one of the theologians was on the panel was saying, well, maybe this is a sign for American Christians. Maybe it's got nothing to do. I said, well, that's not what the Bible says. So it's entertaining. By the way, you can watch it online. Uh, the panel discussion is available online. As far as the planets lining up, I saw that yesterday on uh, YouTube that, uh, yeah, we got five planets lining up. Uh, and you have to get up early in the morning to see them. But yeah, the five planets that are visible to the naked eye are all going to be in a nice line. And uh, it indicated that this is a rare event. It's not a rare event. I've lived long enough to see it several times. So uh, uh, these things do happen. And of course, every time it happens, people say, this is going to be a catastrophe upon the Earth because mm -hmm. the gravitational pull of the five planets is lining up uh, on uh, the Earth. Well, those planets are far enough away and uh, nowhere near as massive as the sun. Uh, the sun is a thousand times more massive than Jupiter. Uh, that any lining up of the, of the uh, continents mm -hmm. is not going to have any significant effect on the Earth. So the idea mm -hmm. is going to cause worldwide catastrophic earthquakes and floods. Uh, I don't think so. Is there anything biblically about it? There's nothing in the Bible about the planets lining up. Oh. So. Enjoy the event. Get up early tomorrow morning, uh, go outside, and look at the five planets all lined up. Okay. Got uh, another online question? Yeah, got a couple more. But, uh, assuming man did not fall, how can you imagine Eden with its limited space when the population increases and people began obeying Genesis 128, which is to populate the whole earth? Yes. Well, God did say that to Adam and Eve. He said, uh, I want you to manage the resources of planet Earth for the benefit of all life. 
and I want you to reproduce, multiply, and fill the earth. And for obvious reasons, if humans are going to be the managers of planet Earth, they need to occupy the Earth. You can't really manage the resources of planet Earth if you're just in one spot and you've got a tiny population. So God's goal all along is that we humans would become numerous, numerous enough that we could manage the resources of the whole planet for the benefit of all life. And the question is, well, what if Adam and Eve had not sinned? Well, they were in a garden. Uh, the garden is a relatively small locale. We know that uh, based on what we see in Genesis chapter 4, uh, where it talks about the land of Nod uh, being east of the Garden of Eden. And the land of Nod wasn't that far away. Uh, so that meant that the Garden of Eden was a relatively small locale. Uh, for another reason why is in Genesis 2, God has Adam uh, manage the garden. So the garden was big, uh, but it was small enough uh, that a couple of people could tend the garden. But I believe God's intent was if Adam and Eve had not sinned, uh, that they would extend the Garden of Eden. Uh, kind of what we can do right now. I mean, uh, you can make your garden bigger. And so his goal was, hey, you see this garden? This is how I want the rest of the planet to look. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to be identical to the garden, but he said, I want this planet to be as well managed as this garden that you're living in right now. So that's the mandate. We're to manage the resources of planet Earth so that the entire planet is Eden-like. Not identical to the Garden of Eden, uh, but identical in the sense that conditions are optimal uh, for all life uh, that exists. Okay, any other questions from the live audience? Got another one from We've the... We've got more. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this one is... Uh, Gregory Herrera, Jr. What do you expect to happen at the moment of death for a Christian? What should I expect? Yeah, I've been asked that question when I've been with people who are believers at the point of death. And uh, a lot of this is drawn from conversations I've had uh, with Richard Anderson, who is a pastor for 40 years at the Christ Church Sierra Madre. And uh, he particularly enjoyed in his ministry spending time with people that were on their deathbeds. And what he shared with me is that Psalm 23 really does appear to be true. Psalm 23, written by King David, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are there with me. You will guide me. And uh, what Richard Anderson was sharing with me is that he had 300 plus experiences where he was with Christians who were on their deathbeds and lucid right up to the time that they had passed away, literally talking and then having to go. And he says, consistently, uh, what I observed was they would tell him, I have to say goodbye. He's calling me by name. And they would pass. And so uh, what he would do is when he was with people asking the question, what's it like to die? Well, you'll hear your name and that Jesus will come and personally escort you across uh, the uh, you know, shadow of death into the next life. Uh, but I also taught this to medical people, and I managed to share this with uh, my uh, dad when he was on his deathbed saying, you know, what's going to happen as you approach physical death? Because he was suffering from mesothelioma, but he was lucid right up to the time he passed away. I said, when you get close to death, uh, your organs are going to begin to shut down. The body will stop trying to maintain itself. And uh, you'll become confused because it's also going to affect your brain. So don't be surprised if in the last week you become confused. And also don't be surprised uh, within, uh, say, a day of passing, you begin to feel really warm. Because what's happening is your body stops trying to retain heat. And so it basically just starts radiating heat. It says you're going to feel like you're burning up. And that's just a sign that your body is releasing its body heat and you're close. I also said probably about 24 to 48 hours that you pass, you're going to feel like you're getting better. 
And again, it's the body stopping trying to maintain itself. So the fact that the body is no longer burning up all that energy to try to maintain itself actually means that you kind of feel good and so your confusion will go away. Uh, and you're going to feel like you're getting better. But that's a sign that it's literally uh, within a day or two. And then you'll hear your name being called. And then that will be the time you go from this life to the next life. Now Richard Anderson also told me he's been with people who are not Christians, who are lucid up to the time of their death. And he says, consistently what I saw is as it began to approach the last few hours, and especially the last few minutes, they would begin cursing God in the most vile ways and actually excited about the prospect that they're going to hell. So what it revealed to me is they want to go to hell. And they're excited about having no more to do with God, uh, but they're cursing and screaming at God all the way. So, uh, but most people die when they're not lucid. Because you know, when the body begins to shut down, you lose your capacity, you go into a coma. But I can share this with you. Even when people are in a coma during the last hours of their life, they almost always are able to hear. And so one of the stories I put in my book, uh, Always Be Ready, is uh, talking to an atheist physicist in the hospital who was in a deep coma just days before he was about to die and uh, was able, it's a funny story because I walked in there and uh, the wife and the daughter were there and I said, you know, is it okay if I speak to your husband? He said, about what? Well, I said, these are his last hours. Uh, he's going to be going from this life to the next life. I think as a scientist, he's going to want to know what it's all about. And the wife was adamant, you're not talking to my husband. He's an atheist. He doesn't want to hear any of this. I said, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't I just share with you uh, what I propose to share with your husband? And if you think it's too offensive, I'll walk out. She said, fine. So I shared with her, but I shared loud enough that he could hear. And uh, the daughter was holding his hand. And she said, Mom, he's squeezing my hand. She said, impossible. He hasn't been able to do that for two weeks. She says, well, he squeezed it again. And, uh, and then when I was kind of giving the last part of the gospel message uh, to the wife to see if she would approve of it, she said, he opened his eyes. And the uh, wife insisted that that was impossible. But I managed to talk to the daughter by herself, helped me said, everything I said was true. And I says, well, I think your dad really wanted to hear what I was sharing uh, with your mom. And I think he's ready to go from this life to the next life. And incidentally, the nurse that alerted me about this physicist, she told me the next day when she was just with this man all by himself, she was able to repeat the gospel message to him. And says, once again, he squeezed my hand. So things can happen in those last few minutes. And even someone who's a committed atheist, those last few minutes. Because what happens with a lot of people is they live their lives like they're never going to die. When they finally recognize, hey, this is really it then they tend to get serious uh, about the real uh, spiritual needs they have in their life. You want to take one more question? One more question. Okay. And then we have a prayer request. I'll give that back to you in a minute. Okay. Uh, this is Paul Lombardi. Regarding the uh, James Webb uh, telescope, will it be able to look back before the cosmic microwave background? It will not be able to look back before the cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, you need radio waves to be able to see that far. Um, the cosmic microwave background radiation is brightest at millimeter wavelengths. The uh, James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope. Now, if you're looking at really far infrared wavelengths, you can see the cosmic microwave background radiation. But I don't think the James Webb Space Telescope is equipped to make observations in the deep infrared. Uh, its main goal uh, was designed to make observations of really distant stars and galaxies that are heavily redshifted. And so uh, I'm not, I don't know off the top of my head the wavelength range. Uh, it's possible that 
it has enough extent into the infrared that it might be able to see the cosmic microwave background radiation, but nowhere near at the sensitivity that you can at millimeter wavelengths. So uh, it's, it, the intent is not to use it uh, to look at the cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, we're hoping you'll uh, do a prayer down and include uh, Rob. He's got a heart condition. He's in uh, Perth. I think that's Australia. And, uh, Is so this Robert Rao? I th he didn't give me his last name. Okay. He's called uh, Sentinel Apologetics. Yes, that's Robert Rao. Okay. Uh, he's a young man. It sounds like he's got a heart issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, we definitely need to be in prayer for him. Okay. Uh, I got to meet him when I was in Perth. And by the way, uh, thanks to Robert, uh, the recordings of this uh, Paradoxes class uh, get distributed to tens of thousands of people. Uh, he's got the, thanks to Robert, we got the biggest exposure uh, to. Uh, so yeah, we definitely want to be in prayer for Robert. Uh, he's in his 30s, so. Father in heaven, we do lift up Robert before you. We pray in particular for the doctors that are gonna be working with him on his heart issues. Lord, that they would have a completely accurate diagnosis of what they're dealing with. And uh, Father, we pray that uh, they would not only have an accurate diagnosis, but they would have uh, a treatment. And we pray that the treatment uh, would be successful. Uh, that uh, Rob Rowe would be brought back to us uh, in uh, complete health. And Father, uh, you saved me from a heart issue many years ago and brought me back stronger than even before. We pray that for uh, Robert as well. Lord, that, that we thank you that this was caught early in his life. And Lord, that we pray uh, that the doctors, uh, through the work of their hands and your Holy Spirit, uh, would uh, be able to bring him back. And Father, we thank you for the ministry of uh, Robert through Sentinel Apologetics. We pray you continue to bless him and uh, Lord enable him uh, through that uh, ministry to bring many hundreds and thousands of people to faith in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for that prayer request. Okay, we'll see all of you in a couple of weeks and next week uh, you're gonna hear from, uh, yeah, Mark is gonna give a talk on uh, evolution and how to argue for evolution. And I like what you're doing, Mark, in the sense that maybe there's a better way to get people thinking about evolution. And hey, uh, Mark, you were involved in the book, uh, thinking about evolution. And so I suspect we're gonna get some insights uh, from the book as well as some of your personal insights. And uh, hopefully you'll bring a copy of the book with you uh, next week so people can actually see it on camera, uh, that'd be great, okay?